Good morning. Welcome to the First Unitarian Church of Honolulu. My name is Steve. I will be your worship associate this morning. We are a free religious community inspired by our shared principles and a mission boldly to grow compassion, justice, and joy. joy. You are all welcome in this place. Please join me in lighting the chalice this morning. Would somebody like to come help light the chalice? You're it. Get up here. What's your name? Eve. Eve. Eve's been here before. <laughs> Let there be light. Let it shine in dark places, in moments of pain, in times of grief, in the darkness of hatred, violence, oppression, where there is discouragement and despair. Wherever darkness is, we put it to the light. Let it be. I'm here at First Unitarian Church of Honolulu because I chose to belong. The people of our congregation belong because those who came before us chose to welcome us and include us and make space for us. And now our newest members belong because inherent in this faith is a belief that there is room for all who come in friendship, in freedom, and in peace. Today, we welcome into our community these new members who have chosen to make a commitment to this congregation and to Unitarian Universalism by going through the pathway to membership and by signing our membership book. Today, please welcome and come up front as I call you, Sue Green. <laughs> Jeff Kim. <laughs> Jim Krause. Arn Lisnoff. Katie and Mark Metzger. Sisson Smallman. And Kai White. Now, notice that we have eight new members in the order of service. Only three, we're expecting five, anybody here? Only three are with us in person here at this moment. The rest are with us in spirit. Um, I know Mark's family is here. He's with us in spirit. Uh, and Arn Listnoff and Sisson Smallman uh, also sent in a message. They're currently snowbirding in deepest, darkest Rhode Island. <laughs> Otherwise, they would be here. They sent in a message for us, and I would like to read that message for you now. From Arn Lisnoff and Sisson Smallman. Aloha and good Sunday morning to all the congregants. We are so pleased to call ourselves members of the First Unitarian Church of Honolulu though we are greeting you from snowy and cold Rhode Island. We moved to Oahu last year to join family there, and indeed we also found a large and welcoming ohana in the church. Even though we are no longer full-time Hawaii residents, it was very important to us to become official members of the First Unitarian Congregation. Nearly 36 years ago, we were married in a Unitarian church here in Rhode Island, where we still experience a wash of emotions, recalling our wedding and picturing the family and friends who shared the day with us. Through the years, 
is it really that many? We've attended a number of different Unitarian churches. We always find the expected commonality of life values, seeking of truth, celebration of diversity, and respect for the natural world. From our first visit, Fouche has provided a similar sense of homecoming. But Fouche, such an unfortunate acronym, I'm reading here, folks. <laughs> Has also been something completely new and different, which we have found in no other church, a source of joy. We fell in love with this church, with Jennifer and the spirits, with the welcoming members of the congregation, with the call and commitment to action. Together, these elements are so energetic and energizing, and we are honored to be a part of it all. We will be back next November through the winter, and we'll rejoin with all of you. We will be present in Hawaii only part-time, but we consider ourselves full-time members of the church. We are grateful to all of you. Can we get an amen? Amen. amen. <laughs> Aloha Nui Loa, Arn Lisnoff, and Sisson Smallman. And Kai White just joined us, so would you mind coming up and being acknowledged? So those two stories are just one of many of how folks have come to find a home here in our spiritual community. And before we officially bring you in as new members, I just have a few questions to ask you. Don't worry, I won't try to stump you or anything, but we just have to make sure that you have to work for your lay, all right? So, <laughs> all of you, <laughs> will you commit yourselves to the Unitarian Universalist principles and purposes and to boldly grow compassion, justice, and joy both within and outside of this spiritual community? Hold that thought. Don't say anything yet. Will you accept our gifts of fellowship, discovery, connection, and service. Will you offer us your unique presence and gifts and your first children? <laughs> oh, sorry, that's not easy. Will you offer us, um, will you add your name to the long history of Unitarian Universalists? If you do, please say we will. Can I get a committee to... <laughs> <laughs> no. You may not put together a committee suit. Um, the rest of you. <laughs> Great. So with that, I'm going to ask the Keiki to give these wonderful people a lay. Jim, please Jim come on up. Krause. Jim Krause, come on down. Mahalo, you all. <laughs> to the congregation, have some questions for you as well. Will you welcome these new members with the warmth and comfort of your fellowship? Will you promise to support their spiritual journey among us? Will you share our triumphs and our struggles as our community grows and changes? If you do, please say, we will. We will. Unfortunately, no lace for you. It's not in our budget. <laughs> With that, we invite you to welcome our new members. Thank you. You may be seated. 
how is this for volume? Okay? There we go. Okay, it's time for a story for all ages. So all of you people out there of all ages, come on down and have a seat. <laughs> Whoever wants to get a front row view. This book is called When Sophie Gets Angry. Really, really angry. Now we've been talking about famous women in history and Sophie isn't a woman yet. She's just still growing up, but she might be famous and she actually already has a book published, so <laughs> that's pretty close. Okay, um, raise your hand if you've ever felt angry. Anybody here ever felt angry? How about if you, if you felt really, really angry, raise your hand even higher. Yeah. You know, when, when I feel really, really angry, sometimes I'm scared. But when I see someone else who feels really, really angry, sometimes I'm very scared, yeah. And um, this is what Sophie does when she feels really, really angry. When Sophie gets angry, really, really angry, by Molly Bang. Sophie was busy playing when her sister grabbed Gorilla. My turn! No, said Sophie. Yes, said her mother. It is her turn now, Sophie. <laughs> and as her sister snatched away Gorilla, Sophie fell over a truck. Oh. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Oh, is Sophie ever angry now? <laughs> is she in right relationship with her sister? <laughs> she kicks and she screams. She wants to smash the world to smithereens. She roars a red, red roar. Sophie is a volcano ready to explode. <laughs> And when Sophie gets angry, really, really angry, pa bam she runs. She runs and runs and runs until she can't run anymore. Then, for a little while, she cries. Now she sees the rocks, the trees, and ferns and she hears a bird. She comes to the old beech tree and she climbs. She feels the breeze blow her hair. She watches the water and the waves. The wide world comforts her. Sophie feels better now. She climbs back down and heads for home. The house is warm and smells good, and everyone is glad that she's home. I'm home. Everything's back together again. And Sophie isn't angry anymore. That's the end. Okay. Oops. Here we go. Let's sing our kicky up. We will take one more step till there is peace for us and everyone will take one more step. One more word, we will say one more word till every word is heard by everyone. We'll say one more word, one more song, one more song. We will say The opening words this morning are adapted from The Ark, a weekly message of our progressive interfaith Ohana that we publish here 
at First Unitarian. Message dated February 15th, just one month ago today. Compassion calls us to understand our own suffering, to feel the suffering of others, and to act to relieve that suffering. Compassion calls us to act in two ways that engage our heads, our hearts, our hands, and our faith. First, we are called to sit together to celebrate and to refresh the miracle of our interdependence. And here we are. Second, we are called to stand together in healing work to celebrate and to refresh the miracle of our community. There we go. Please join me in the reading. Don't leave your broken heart at the door. Don't leave your anger behind. Bring them with you. Bring your loving and our courage and our Bring your need for healing and our power to heal. There is work to do. And we have all the need to do our in this That's an interesting slide. <laughs> I hadn't seen, I didn't notice that one. Yeah, when I, um, a few weeks ago, a month, month or so ago, I happened to be at a worship team meeting and I, I saw, and uh, I had no business saying yes to anything because I have such a lot on my plate and I saw this title, uh, Trauma and Resilience, and I thought, well, isn't that interesting? Because the following week, I'm leading a, a week-long workshop out at Camp Mokalia on the theme of trauma and resilience. So I thought, well, this at least would be a, a, a good warm-up for me. Some people, when they saw the title of the sermon, that's half of it, I saw something nasty in the woodshed. I said, what is that about? Well, that's, that's for Charlotte. Char Charlotte likes attention-grabbing titles, and I thought that would be a good attention-grabbing title. So, yeah, you're welcome. Uh, one of there's there's a movie that I often show at the workshops that I do, and it's Cold Comfort Farm. It's based on a novel by Sheila uh, Gibbons, uh, Sheila Gibbons, Stella Gibbons, Stella Stella Gibbons, written in, in 1935, and it's curiously. Um, I consider this to be a, what would I say? Um, it's, it's a complete model of family systems therapy and how it works, which, which was written way before there was any family systems therapy. In the movie version, it starts with a scene of a young girl in kind of black and white, and she's traipsing through the woods, la la la, having a good time, and she's going down this path, and then she comes to this woodshed, and she goes up to the door, and something's going on in the woodshed, and she reaches down, and she slowly opens the door, and then suddenly it switches to this scene of the girl as an old lady rising up from her sleep and saying, I saw something nasty in the woodshed. Now, when I've shown this film to um, soldiers and so forth that I, I worked with at, at Tripler, they got, they would almost always get really pissed off because, except for the, the Kate Beckinsale parts, <laughs> they liked that. Um, they wanted to know what did she see in the woodshed and what was the wrong done to Robert Post. The book and movie leave these central questions unanswered because the point is it kind of makes no difference what the thing was. That's not what it's about. It's about holding on to something that it says in the movie that, that may or may not have happened. Uh, one of the characters said to the, says to the old lady when she does her line, I'm sure you did, dear, but did it see you? 
And the other part of the title comes from an interview I, I heard with uh, Reverend Nadia Bowles Weber. She's a, a, a Lutheran minister. And in this interview, she says, we've glamorized certain types of brokenness. Now, this is one of the things that I've, I've seen in, this, in the, the field of the treatment of trauma and post-traumatic stress disorder. And a lot of things in our, our culture, I, I think, uh, where, and this is what happened in, in Cold Comfort Farm. All of this power was given to the old lady because she saw something nasty in the woodshed. So we turn over power to these people. You know, we can't offend anybody. In the field of, of psychotherapy, it's become a cottage industry. There's springing up all you know, so books and methods and techniques, and everybody wants to get, it, get in on treating this. And typically what happens, I, I hope there are no psychotherapists in the room that I'm going to offend. Any, anybody? OK. <laughs> Okay, I may, offend, may I offend you? Thank you. <laughs> and you don't do this, I'm sure, but they create business for themselves. They become an expert on something, and whatever their, the expertise, expert, whatever their expertise is in, uh, whether it be uh, narcissism, sociopathy, or post-traumatic stress disorder, they often tend to keep the person sick, because they want to have so many sessions, and they create more business for themselves. You, we saw this you know, some years back with, with uh, multiple personality disorders. It became a competition to be a, a therapist who had the most, you know, the client with the most number of personalities buried inside him or her. And it was eventually revealed that this was all created by the therapist. So uh, as, you know, working with these people, I thought, well, I don't want to keep, keep them uh, dependent on me. And I you know, um, don't want to see a growing number of people suffering from trauma. We all experience traumatic events in our lives. Every single one of us at some time in our life will experience some traumatic event. And what a lot of therapists don't want to say, although this is a growing uh, movement in the field, is that most people don't have this kind of post-traumatic stress disorder effect. Most people recover on their own in a very natural kind of way. 80, 90 percent, you know, within three months after this big event, their lives are not being influenced by it. So the question in the field is, why is this? Why, why are some resilient and some not resilient. And there's, there is a growing movement within the field to focus on the resilience, not look so much at the trauma. What do we have next here? So what is trauma? Is that what it looks like? Uh, I, I googled Google images search on, on trauma and uh, the images are horrific. This was one of the, the least offensive ones I, I found. It's, it's sort of depersonalized a little bit into a doll. And excuse me. What is not recognized in the, the psychological field of post-traumatic stress disorder is that it's actually an injury to the body that happens. And if you think of it that way, uh, then I, I, when, I, when I thought of it that way, I started looking at how the body responds to a simple injury. Now, one, one year, one day, many years ago, is maybe my 50th birthday. Uh, we were planning the, this uh, hike to this area where you had to have a special permit, and I was very excited to be doing this, and I was bustling about the house, and, and uh, in the course of doing that, banged my little toe into the leg of a furniture. Think about your little toe. Put your attention into your little toe. Can you find it? You have to look for it, don't you? I mean, it's not there in your awareness most of the time. We went up, we, you know, I threw my stuff, I just threw my boots in the car. We drove up to, to uh, 
where, where we're going to hike, and I got out to put my boots on. My foot was that big. It would, it would not fit into the, the boot. And so I had to hike. Uh, we did about 12 miles in rugged terrain in my slippers. And where was that little toe the whole time? This is me. It was right there in the center. So what your body does when you are injured, it, and I, I was held in this posture like this, and I hiked like, like this the whole way. Anybody injured something, broke a bone or cut? Anybody ever have any of that? Boy, this is a group of... Oh, okay, lots of yeses, okay. You know, the pain, it holds, it, it holds your attention on that. The circulation, all the swelling and redness, that's the, the body's holding attention. If you break a bone, it rigidifies, it holds, it splints, it holds things firm in a place where it can heal. So that's the basic mechanism of healing from an injury. And if the injury is so-called so, so psychological, you do the same thing. You hold on to that. Uh, in, inside the brain, there's a part of it called the hippocampus. And we usually, so if you associate it with anything, uh, it's associated with memory, short-term memory. The hippocampus also has place cells in it. So it maps the world. So it's constantly taking information about where you are and um, placing your body within the world, which is actually within you anyway. So all that world that you're experiencing out there is really all just in here, but that's another sermon. Uh, and it does that same holding. Now, this hippocampus turns out to be one of the, the main parts of your body that gets damaged by, by uh, traumatic experiences. And it keeps you in that place where that horrible thing happened. That's what you see with soldiers coming back from Vietnam or Iraq or wherever. They have these flashbacks. They're convinced that they are in Afghanistan. One young man I worked with came back, got married, had a baby. Uh, he was in the first um, group that went to Afghanistan. And some very interesting things started happening. He started avoiding his, his, the wife and, and baby whom he loved. He wanted to stay as far away from them as he possibly could. And when he was there, he spent all of his time, all of his time going around checking the, the locks, the windows and the doors, because he was carrying Afghanistan around with him. Wherever he was, was Afghanistan. His hippocampus had locked onto that, held it, and I think there's probably some quantum entanglement thing going on in there because I, I really, you can actually feel the, you know, it's like the, this distortion of space and time around these people. So whenever he was with his family, they were in Afghanistan. They were not safe. If he was away from them, oh, they're safe at home. He carried Afghanistan with him. So, in short, I'm going to push this too. Holding, rigidity, fear, pain, stuckness, inflexibility, lockdown. It's a physical thing we do with our bodies when it's injured, and your mind does it too. We won't spend a lot of time on that. Um, is this our future? Is there. Do you, how many of you think there's going to be serious trauma in, in the not-too-distant future? How many of you listen to the, I'll, I'll try to keep the dirty words out, the news on a daily basis? How horrible is it? It's sickening, it's disgusting. Some of the, how, it's like, are, are we the same as, as the, the 13th century? You know, Bar, Barbara Tuckman's famous uh, history of the 13th century, A Distant Mirror, she in her time, she thought that that was kind of mirroring what was going on in the 13th century. Um, what are we doing to prepare for this future? What are we as a church doing to prepare for this future? I didn't really expect an answer to that question. <laughs> Thomas Merton tells us there is no 
where in you a paradise that is no place, and there you do not enter except without a story. Whoops. To enter there is to become unnameable. So can you be in that no place while that's going on? And if you are in that no place, if we are all figure out how to access that place, is this likely to be the future? Looking up uh, Google searches on images on, on resilience, there, there are dozens of showing some plant flower breaking, you know, breaking through the, the concrete. It's like that seems to be the most common image, of a flower coming up through concrete and breaking it up. Um, the point I'm wanting to make here is that resilience is both the antidote to trauma. If you are, get stuck from something traumatic, uh, obviously it's kind of the opposite of that. Inflexibility is resilience, the ability to bounce back. It is also the inoculum. That, that, that is to say, if you have resilience, if you practice things that develop and enhance your resilience, you're less likely to end up in that place. And some of the things that this list is, can be way longer, but these were some of the top ones. Um, things that enhance resilience. Hope. Faith. Those are kind of almost religious words, aren't they? Uh, curiosity, optimism, gratitude, forgiveness. Jennifer did a brilliant piece on forgiveness last week. Thank you. And a uh, big one to me, connection. That is another sermon. <laughs> or maybe not. So, is this our future? We have a role, a responsibility, and we are superbly placed to make a difference, both for individuals and for the society at large, to prevent that, to survive that, prefer preferably prevent it, but you know, we can argue back and forth whether you know, this is, is you know, a possible future is caused by us. Um, there is also the 100% probability the planet will be smashed into by an asteroid. There are, there are all kinds of, of ways that trauma can come upon us. The, the socially inflicted, we have some ability to influence and change that future. Maybe even the asteroid, who knows? We work on this on two fronts. I've been doing a, a, one of the pieces I'm working on is, is to demonstrate that there is no such thing as inside and outside. In the universe, there, there is no outside to the universe. All the universe, the, the, the whole world is contained within each of us. The experience that we're having of that is within us. So if there's no outside to that, there's no outside to us. There's really no inside, no outside. But it's a useful construct in many ways. So that's all it is. Inside and outside, that's a construct. So this Mobius strip, you know how Mobius strips work. You, you, know, you end up traveling on both sides. So if you go out, you end up coming in. If you go in, you end up going out. So you can't tell the difference always. In the work that I do, often when I'm working on somebody, I, it, it turns out that I'm actually working on myself. And then when I work on myself, I'm actually working on another person. There's that boundary between people becomes very indistinct and blurred. Uh, in, in terms of the church, there's, there is work to be done out there, out there in the world. There is injustice. And there's work to be done in here. And that's what we come together here on the Sunday for, is, is the inner work. 
and to give energy and direction and, and nourishment to do the outer work, which ends up often being inner work anyway. So you can't always distinguish the two. So let me go, I just want to quickly run through this, this list that I put up. There are just a few words. I'm trying to keep track of time, I'm probably already over time. Um, this is from, from Jonifer's talk last week, the tail end of, of that quote, I love that. One is given back the honor of each day's newness. That's what's taken away from you by, by the traumas, whether big trauma or little daily pecking away at, at you traumas. Uh, the, the day stops being new. So forgiveness, letting go of that stuff, brings back that, that newness. Oops. Vulnerability, this is another big topic, the gateway to true aliveness. Open yourself up to one another. Open yourself up to the world. Trauma causes you to tighten down, close off from the world, and deep relaxation, letting go, opening, being, you know, curious when, when somebody seems to be offending you instead of jumping to that, you know, I get power from being offended. Hope, I love this, it's not, is an orientation of the spirit. I'm going to keep this up with myself. Hope is an orientation of the spirit, of the heart of the spirit. It is not the conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something makes sense regardless of how it turns out. So hope is an important element. Uh, I was reading Chesterton's uh, biography of Charles Dickens, a well-known Unitar <coughs> Unitarian, and he pointed out that Dickens' novels actually changed the world, whereas he compared them to another Victorian novelist with sim similar projects who was a total pessimist, and nothing came of any of his projects. It all just kind of went away. Bleak House, uh, the orphanages, you know, just about everything he turned his pen to had, a, had an effect on the world, and that's because of his optimistic attitude. If we deny our happiness, resist our satisfaction, we lessen the importance of their deprivation. We must risk delight. We can do without pleasure, but not delight, not enjoyment. We must have the stubbornness to accept our gladness and the ruthless furnace of this world. To make injustice, the only measure of our attention is to praise the devil. Oh, well, that's not too Christian for some of you. Pardon? Where's that book? Oh, I'm sorry. It's Jack Gilbert, who's a, a poet uh, from a, a brief for the defense. I've got two clicks going here, sorry. Uh, Plato said, philosophy is a bite to the heart, and Aristotle replied, it, and it begins with wonder. Curiosity, this is, this is a long one, I don't know if you can read that or not. I, um, I put this up there because it makes me think of Unitarians. Um, the, um, it's unruly. It doesn't like rules. How many, how many of you like rules? Or at least it assumes that all rules are provisional subject to the laceration of a smart question nobody has yet thought to ask. It disdains the approved pathways, preferring diversions, unplanned excursions, impulsive left turns. In short, curiosity is deviant. I like that. Pursuing it is liable to bring you into conflict with authority. How many of you like that conflict with authority? Yes. Everyone from Galileo to Charles Darwin to Steve Jobs could have attested. A society that values order above all else will seek to suppress curiosity, but a society that believes in progress, innovation, and creativity will cultivate it, recognizing that the most inquiring minds of its people constitute its most valuable asset. And using curiosity in your lives on a day-to-day -day basis in your interactions with people is incredibly powerful. I'd love to put in a story here, but I don't have the time for it. But um, I've seen people just completely change, you know, when they're you know, kind of on the attack. And it's like, I'm curious. And you approach, rather, rather than defensiveness, locking down, curiosity opens you up. It makes you vulnerable, and it gets you through some amazing things. 
Faith. Here's a big one. Um, look at the facts of the world. You see a continual and progressive triumph of the right, not the right wing. I do not pretend to understand the moral universe. The arc is long one, and my eye reaches but a little ways. I cannot calculate the curve and complete the figure by the experience of sight. I can divine it by conscience, but from what I see, I am sure it bends toward justice. Who knows who that... You shut up. <laughs> who, who is it? Who is it? No. Nope. Theodore Parker. Theodore Parker. A, one of our a great Unitarian minister and, and abolitionist in the 19th century. Um, he divined it by conscience. Turns out he was very prophetic. Uh, Steven Pinker has done this you know, enormous documentation proving that, and more recently, Michael Shermer in his book, The Moral Arc, we are way better than we have been. We get a distorted view by that nasty, nasty media that is constantly putting the ugliest and the most awful in front of us. And even with ISIS and all of that, the world is still becoming a moral place, a better place. Um, kind of explaining the how of this, the why of this, there's uh, uh, these two guys from Yale, uh, Nicholas Christakis and uh, I always forget the other name because it's so easy, um, James, James Fowler. Fowler, yeah. Um, sociologist and Christakis is a, is a medical doctor and a sociologist who are studying um, social connectedness. And we have a, a rather remarkable and surprising ability to affect what goes on within not just your immediate social network, your friends, but your friends of your friends, and your friends of your friends of your friends. So you have influence over a huge number of people simply by becoming yourself better. That influences people to get better and better and better. And this is informal social networks. You know, the governments come and play a part in this, and you know, Pinker shows all of that. And the remarkable thing about social networks, they've looked at it from an evolutionary point of view, why have they evolved and why have they maintained? It's because they tend toward the good. The social network tends toward the good. So Christakis and Fowler are pretty much proving Theodore Parker and you know, the mechanism of it. You know, there's still a lot of work to be done there. But if you support and enhance and connect, it actually has a tendency to move us toward the good. So I think through the power of connection and connectedness, we can probably prevent or avert or at least ameliorate that nasty, horrible future that we're seeing ahead. I should probably... <laughs> I'm way over time. And I'm boring you to death. No. <laughs> um, well, actually, I do want to go back to this one. What, one more thing. We have, we have not escaped, nor have we in any sense diminished the mystery of our existence. I don't think she was talking about Unitarian Universalist, but it sounds like it. We have only rejected any language that would seem to acknowledge it. And I could do a whole sermon on this too of, of what, what we've allowed to happen to us through other people taking over the language. So let us practice the sacrament of the present moment, and I will end with some words from William Wordsworth. Poets usually are better at this than anybody. This is from um, his, his poem, a few lines composed a few miles above Tintern Abbey. And I have felt a presence that disturbs me with joy of elevated thoughts, a sense sublime of something far more deeply interfused, whose dwelling is the light of the setting suns and the round ocean and the living air and the blue sky and in the mind of man, a motion and a spirit that impels all thinking things 
all objects of all thought and rolls through all things. Reflect on your own. <laughs>